What's up, A-Push students? Welcome to another exciting online video lecture. Today we're going to talk about the Progressive Era, or at least finishing up the Progressive Era, going all the way up to Woodrow Wilson. And disclaimer, if you hear a helicopter in the background, that's because I live in the ghetto and they pass by quite often. Uh, women and Progressive Reform. We're going to see that women will play a key role in pushing forward reform measures at Prior to this, society believed that women belonged in the household. It was the cult of domesticity. There's very few women professionals. Not a lot of, if you're a little girl, not a lot to look forward to in becoming a lawyer or a scientist. Usually you're relegated to having children and a family and taking care of them. But then for the progressive era, there's a new women emerges and new women, this what happens is we get activism and they will create many reforms like prohibition for one and here is a picture of women uh, protesting for better rights at work better work conditions women working at factories textile factories usually some places for social reform were settlement houses they they shared a strong commitment to social reform taking care of the poor helping out the less fortunate a uh, famous one to know would be Jane Addams, who opens up Hull House in Chicago, and it provides social services to the poor, usually immigrants. And the big difference here is that immigrants usually went to political bosses who exchanged uh, food baskets and ex for votes or things like that. But for settlement houses, there was nothing to exchange. It was straight up, you get help for just because. And, but key thing to take away is it empowered women and it helped them build leadership skills that they will go on to use for voting rights among them. an early social reform movement led by women would be the temperance movement temperance means to abstain from alcohol and women will lead the way in this temperance movement one of the reasons main reasons is that usually the male of the household would end up blowing his whole paycheck or all his money at this local saloon or if not they'd come home in a drunkenness and take out their anger on the, either the wife or the children the biggest group is called the women's christian temperance union it's run by francis willard at its peak it has 150,000 members and they lead the charge first by going state to state and pushing legislation to turn those states into dry states to end alcohol they felt that they had a moral duty to eliminate alcohol abuse again those men that are using up all their money and leading to more a poor livelihoods so we get this movement to shut down the saloons. saloons are of course bars women are not allowed at saloons it's a place for men men only this is where they drink after work uh, states are the ones that start this off. They begin to outlaw alcohol on their own. They pass legislation, and states that don't that are that have that make alcohol legal will be known as dry states. States where alcohol is still legal would be wet states. A famous uh, woman that helped shut down saloons would be Carrie A. Nation. She carried a hatchet, went into saloons, and tore the places up and forced the closure of many saloons so quite a badass woman here and the other major group that will come about this is the anti-saloon league they're going to join forces with the wctu and they're going to push not only for just state legislation but for federal legislation in supporting the ending of alcohol and there's many supporters, Henry Ford, Andrew Carnegie, the NAACP, the American Federation of Labor, and even the KKK are all for making the country dry. And they all have their own reasons for it. Um, for factory owners, it's they'll have better productive workers. NAACP, it's that they'll have better education for African Americans and the KKK thinks that um, certain groups of people should not be drinking alcohol because it turns them into monsters 
And finally, eventually, all this will lead to the 18th Amendment. We'll go in more depth when we go over the 1920s about prohibition. But 18th Amendment is created, signed in 1919, and it outlaws alcohol. And the other movement will be women's suffrage. And that begins with Seneca Falls Convention in New York in 1848. It's, there are several men as well as women at this convention and they write up a declaration of sentiments which is similar written in the same form as a declaration of independence it says we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal including women unlike what jefferson wrote in 1776 it's led by elizabeth Cady stanton and lucretia mott in gaining the right to vote uh, lead to more aggressive tactics uh, led by the National Women's Party. Alice Paul pushes for uh, protesting in front of the White House, heckling senators and congresspeople. And some of these things were seen as unladylike. The biggest thing was that they protested during World War One in front of the White House and were imprisoned for doing such a thing and force fed. But eventually, the 19th Amendment will be passed and women will gain the right to vote. No citizen could be denied the right to vote on account of sex, is what the 19th Amendment will say. Now for the big picture, things to take away is at the end of the, by the end of the progressive era, women won the vote but were still largely absent from professional careers. This will not start to change until even the 1960s, 70s, and it's still going on today. There's sectors of professional careers that women are largely absent from and finally world war one will lead to the end of the progressive era as people want to return to normalcy and the 1920s we get the beginning of mass entertainment and shopping all good american things and the progressive era will inspire the feminist movement that sparked in the 60s and the 70s and that would be the big picture for. And next we'll look into progressive presidents, starting with Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, we learned last time, youngest president at 42 years old. He has a strong belief in the power of government. He is a progressive and he is a champion of the square deal, which is for one, conserve natural resources, control corporations, and protect consumers that's part of his square deal and of course he'll also try to protect workers as well teddy roosevelt and one of the first things he deals with is the anthracite coal strike 147,000 mine workers united mine workers struck across pennsylvania and west virginia for unsafe work conditions and low pay and then Teddy Roosevelt stepped in to mediate the matter between management and the labor union. However, management refused to negotiate. They said they weren't having it. But Roosevelt threatens he'll send the army to take over the mines if the management does not want to negotiate. And what ends up happening is the management backs down and it's a big victory for the workers. It's the first time that a president intervene, intervenes in a labor dispute and sides with labor. Previously, we saw la labor strikes where the president sent in the army to put the workers back to work. But this time, he sides with the working class. He becomes a hero for the working class with this. And it becomes a well-celebrated president with his square. And the other thing, theaters will be known as the trust buster trusts are large corporations or monopolies like what john d rockefeller ran and of course there is a sherman antitrust act which forbids trusts however it was rarely used to put a stop to monopolies or trusts it usually only applied to labor unions so they would not uh overpower management but in 1902 theodore roosevelt used this law to break up the national securities company it was a giant railroad company and he broke it up using the Sherman Antitrust Act, and he'll be known as the trust buster. The railroad company was charging crazy fees to farmers, and of course, this is part of his square deal. 
protecting the consumer. And after this incident, after 1902, he'll be known as the Trust Buster. And there's a picture of him with his big stick busting up the trusts. Now it's his chance to protect consumers. And we'll see this thanks to Upton Sinclair's book, The Jungle. If you remember, Muckraker exposes the meatpacking industry. And soon, Congress is pushed to pass the Meat Inspection Act and Pure Food and Drug Act. People read this book, they learn about the disgusting things that happen inside of a meat factory. People are being sold rotten meat or with sprayed with chemicals. And we'll get strict standards on food and drugs that we still have to this day. And that's a cartoon of Mr. Roosevelt standing over the muck with his rake of that meat scandal. Now the next part of his square deal is conserving natural resources. And Roosevelt will indeed do this. He spent a lot of time as a young boy exploring the wilderness or as a young man even hunting. So he loves being in nature and sees a need for man to be able to go to some of these places. Whenever you're feeling down, you go to this and you find inspiration. And he's outraged by how our natural forests are just being exploited to make things. And he appoints Gin Gifford Pinchot to the new National Forest Service. And things they'll do is forest reserves. At this time, 1901, there's 43 million acres of forest reserves. That means places that are protected by the federal government where you cannot build anything or mess with. But by 1909, when he leaves office, it increases four times or over four times to 194 million acres of protected land. And finally, he signs the Antiquities Act of 1906, and he uses that to take over even more forest reserves from states that would have rather used it for corporations to make money off of. One of the places, Muir Woods, that would be in near right outside of San Francisco. And that is a picture of some trees there that I took uh, like three years ago. So while Theodore Roosevelt is about conserving natural resources, there is also people that are for preserving natural resources. The difference is conserving is that humans can take care of it, or preserving is just to leave it untouched and leave it as it be. And biggest preservationist will be John Muir, who believe national parks should be places for rest, inspiration, and prayers. You go there, take a deep breath, walk around, relax. All the cares of the city, all that stuff goes away. And under Roosevelt will get five national parks, 51 bird preserves, and 18 national monuments. Okay, now we're going to see a controversy between the conservationists and the <clears throat> preservationists. The Hetch Hetchy controversy. Hetch Hetchy Valley is in Yosemite National Park. And Gifford Pinchot, National Forest Reserve, says that this is an ideal spot for a dam. Bring water to thousands, even millions of people. Where John Muir and the Preservations believe this to be God's gift and it should be guarded that way. Leave it untouched. Don't turn it into a damn damn. And Roosevelt's faced with a dilemma. He's cool with both Pinchot and Muir. And he's like trying to figure out how am I going to do this? How am I going to make both sides happy? And ultimately he sides with Pinchot, puts it in his hands. And Pinchot agrees to build a dam. And this dam provides 80% of San Francisco's water today. So a bit controversial, but it helps out certainly millions of people in San Francisco. All right, so Roosevelt has a decent presidency. He gets in office as vice president, then becomes president when McKinley is killed. And then he wins an election of his own. And then he decides he will back out and not run for a second term. Or second elected term and he leaves it hands it off to his homie William Howard Taft they're good pals he thinks William Howard Taft will continue the tradition of trust busting he'll continue the square deal so Howard Taft will run for office he gets the Republican nomination once Theodore Roosevelt leaves in 1909 and Taft in 1908 will defeat the Democratic candidate William Jennings Bryan, you should know him by now, three-time presidential loser, William Jennings Bryan. And this will not be the last of William Jennings Bryan. We'll see him come out again in the 1920s in our next lecture. 
But one of the things about Howard Taft, William Howard Taft, is that he will be a bigger trust buster than Theodore Roosevelt. Biggest trusts he busts is Standard Oil Company, thanks to <clears throat> Ida Tarbell and the letter she wrote about how Standard Oil Company was monopolizing the industry. The other thing he pushes for is an eight-hour workday, something that Roosevelt did not push hard for. And finally, 16th Amendment. He is a hard advocate for the 16th Amendment. It will get passed under his presidency. And that, of course, is a graduated income tax on usually people that make over uh, $4,000 a year. And next comes the crazy election of 1912. William Howard Taft will run for a second term. However, at this time, Theodore Roosevelt, who during the president Taft's presidency was traveling around the world, chilling with his family, checking out the lions and the tigers in Africa. He comes back and he sees that Taft has fired his whole cabinet that he that Roosevelt had, and especially gets angry when he fires Gifford Pinchot, the conservationist. So Theodore Roosevelt is like, you know what? I thought Taft, I thought we were homies. I thought you could handle it, but clearly you can't. I'm going to drop my hat in and I'm going to run against you. So Roosevelt jumps into the race for, for the Republican nomination against William Howard Taft. They go head to head and William Howard Taft will get chosen by the Republican Party to lead it. And Roosevelt again, he's like, nah, I still can do better. And he runs on the Progressive Party party creates the progressive party a third party and he will run that way against taft and the democrats on the other hand they're scrambling to choose their candidate and they choose a little known candidate named woodrow wilson he's the governor of new jersey at the time he is a southern he is from the south but he is a well-educated man was a professor at princeton and the president of princeton for a while so he is someone who is well educated, but he has limited political experience, but he's very well educated in law and particularly constitutional law. He is an expert. So Theodore Roosevelt, of course, he'll form his third party, the Progressive Party, also known as the Bull Moose Party, which is what he calls himself the Bull Moose. And there's candidate number one, William Howard Taft, Republican Party. Candidate number two, Theodore Roosevelt, the Bull Moose Party. And Woodrow Wilson, the Democratic Party. And then we're going to get a fourth candidate from the Socialist Party. And that would be Eugene V. Debs. And all four of these will square off in a battle for the presidency in the craziest election of the time, 1912. So this crazy election turns into election of two candidates. Wilson versus the third party candidate, Theodore Roosevelt. And during this time, Roosevelt... Will end up getting shot a couple months before um, be the, before the election. He gets shot in the chest, yet he still delivers a 90-minute speech. His the bullet gets hit hits him in his pocket where he held a 50-page speech, and he went on to give a speech while after he was shot, showing off how much of a bull moose he was. You can't take down a bull moose, he says. But looking at the map here, uh, Woodrow Wilson will become president. He wins largely most of the states thanks to the split of the republican ticket because of theodore roosevelt uh taft didn't have a chance he pretty much gave up at some point it was like yeah i'm not gonna win who cares and it becomes roosevelt versus wilson this will be the most the closest that a third party candidate will be get to the presidency in the history of the united states there will there's no other third party candidate that comes as close as theodore roosevelt did President Woodrow Wilson, he lowers tariff rates by about 8%, helping out some farmers. And also, he signs the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, which establishes banks for the United States. If you remember, in the 1830s, Andrew Jackson cut out the banking system. But Woodrow Wilson will bring it back. Federal Reserve Act serves to manage inflation, prints money, keeps a guard on the banking system. And it's currently being used today and during our recession printing out money and trying to keep the economy afloat and he signs off on the Clayton Antitrust Act of 1914 which will strengthen the Sherman Antitrust Act to further hurt the power of trusts 
and it prevents interlocking directories which means that one person cannot serve over multiple boards of different companies and that's again supposed to prevent trust or like fake monopolies where they act like they have they're broken into several companies but it's really only one person controlling all of them and wilson will largely ignore jim crow segregation he will do nothing about it just as previous presidents have done the south will be left to do what it wants and he will also segregate the military during world war one wilson is quite frankly a racist so doesn't believe blacks should be fighting together with whites and in 1915 to further prove his racism he held a white house screening of dw griffith's the birth of a nation which glorifies the ku klux klan makes it, it and it leads to the kkk rising up again new membership spring on by the 1920s we'll have a large amount of people in the kkk it depicts african americans as the savage beasts that lust for white women and wilson is quoted saying it's like writing history with lightning and my only regret is that it is so terribly true all right so there you have it folks that's the progressive most of the progressive era uh finish up your assignments that i post up and prepare yourself for the upcoming a push exam that you will do online this is the best i could do hopefully you enjoy it and found some learning in this and those are all the words i wish to say